Hello and welcome to the 2022 BRIC Summit Impact or Authenticity panel. My name is Juliana Ipuralde and I'm one of the producers for the summit this year. Thank you so much for attending. We're so excited for you to not only hear our panelists, but to also have you share your thoughts with us in our Discord channel and in our breakout rooms at the end of this panel. And without further ado, I would love to present the moderator for this panel, Larry LeBeau. Larry is the co-founder and executive director of New Filmmakers Los Angeles, an organization committed to highlighting and connecting emerging filmmakers and storytellers worldwide. There we go, sorry, I could not unmute myself. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, welcome. So excited to be here with all of you today. Um, as you can see on your screen, we have a rock star lineup of panelists here to talk about impact through authenticity. Uh, today's um, subject, we're gonna talk about authentic storytelling, which is here to stay. Uh, we're gonna talk about what does successful authenticity look like in every creative department and especially within telling your story. So I would love to kick off today by having each panelist just very briefly um, introduce themselves. Tell us a little bit about you and I'm going to just go in the order of my screen and I'm going to start out with Lauren Martinez. Hello, nice to meet you all. I'm Lauren Martinez. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. My title is VP of Development at Cartoon Network Studios. I'm really excited to be here. Awesome. Thank you, Lauren. And next, I'm going to go to Sarah Eaglehart. Hi, everybody. I'm Betty Washde. Um, my name is Sarah Eaglehart. I'm Ogallala Lakota. I do a ton of stuff. I'm a co-CEO at Return of the Heart Foundation, but I'm also um, a storyteller and do a lot of different projects in that space of virtual reality and documentaries and much more to come, I'm sure. Amazing. Thanks, Sarah. And Marsha Cook next. Hi everyone, I'm Marsha Cook. I am a vice president of ESPN Films and executive producer of 30 for 30. I'm a newbie uh, at ESPN and uh, in my third month, um, longtime news veteran. I was with CBS News uh, for a very, very long time, followed then by Vice, and now I am in my dream job. Thank you. Amazing. Thanks, Marsha. And last but not least, Kim, we've got Kim Williams, everybody. Hi, I am Kim Williams. I am vice president of casting for Walt Disney Television Studios, and I'm also the current president of Casting Society. So thrilled to be here. Amazing. Thanks so much, Kim. So we've got a very accomplished group from all different corners of our industry. And I'd like to start out our conversation today by asking each of you, um, and if there's overlap, that's okay. What does authentic storytelling look like to you? And anyone, feel free to jump in first. Um, take it away, just whoever wants to, whoever wants to get in there. I'll start. This is um, <laughs> Sarah. I, you know, for me, authentic storytelling is something that hasn't necessarily happened for the Native American community. We're still very new at that. So some of the perspectives that I want to see are more um, holistic and authentic to, to the grassroots communities, um, the tribal communities on the reservations, the stories that come from our creation stories, our myths. Um, I want to see more of that from that particular perspective um, through indigenous worldview as what, what I hope and what I want to see more of. Amazing, amazing. And uh, Lauren, how about you? I think authentic storytelling comes from the person who's telling the story. So I think from a development perspective, uh, that's top of mind when it's whose story are we telling and are they the ones telling it? Um, animation is a, is a team sport. There's a lot of people that touch the story at different points, whether it's the writer or the director or the storyboard artist, um, the actor. And we have to look at all levels of who's telling what part of that story. And um, I think having it come from a, a place of uh, often lived experience. And if it can't be that, we need to figure out how to get that person's perspective in that room in leadership. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and then Marsha, do you mind if I go to you next? No, not at all. Um, I think we're going to, I think Kim and I are going to tag team here in terms of um, who is behind the camera, who are in the writer's room, uh, how do we um, uh, recruit uh, talent to tell these stories. Uh, for me now in the sports documentary world, um, I think inclusivity in terms of the subjects that we are focused on, uh, the authentic storytelling is not just the who, what, where, and why. So you bring your journalism self to the story. It's also as Lauren and as uh, Sarah have said, it's who's telling the story. But I think there's so many uh, opportunities when we are telling stories and in the documentary world to really be as inclusive as possible. So directors, producers, writers, editors, uh, graphic design, all of those things add to that authentic way we can tell a story because lived experiences, as Lauren said, are important. You have people at the table who can raise their hand and say, that is not the way that this story should be told. Let me tell you what it is that I know about this subject matter. And you can only have that when you have all of the different uh, voices uh, at the table uh, for um, these kinds of opportunities to tell great stories. And I'll toss to Kim. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, Marsha, and also with what um, Lauren and Sarah said as well. I think it's really important that we um, have a true representation of the world that we all live in. And I think it's really important, and this is from the top down, from the, the people that are green lighting projects to the executives that are giving notes and helping shape stories and scripts to you know, who's in front of the camera, who's behind the camera in all of those roles that it truly is re representative and reflective of our world. Um, because I, I what what I see is there 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 is sort of movement, but it and I and I know change takes time. I do understand that, but I do think that there still remains this this these sort of very narrow lanes that uh, people of color stories are often told from, and they don't um, expand to the full scope of what each community is how they live, what they represent. And I think if you don't have in people in places that understand that or, or um, have an awareness or um, a way to learn about it, it's very difficult to get those projects off the ground, greenlit and, 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 and move forward. And the other thing I will say, because recently there's been sort of more conversation again around um, the colorism issue from uh, the movie um, In the Heights. And what I would say to that is that one of the reasons that conversation and the trouble, the, it's a troubled conversation is because that's one film from, I don't even know how long that represents that one community. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of pressure to put on one film to tell and represent the story of this vast diaspora of culture and people and language and dialects and all of those things. Um, yeah, so for me, I think it is about, you know, adding seats to the table across the board so that we can be um, more reflective of, of the true world that we all live in. Absolutely, 100%. Well, thank you guys. So this is this is a great start in terms of kind of understanding and dissecting what authentic storytelling might look like or what that means to you. But I, I love that everybody on the panel is sort of working in slightly different areas. So Lauren from the animation side of, of a lot of current series that are on air, Sarah from, you know, helping to fundraise for independent projects and producing independent projects, Marsha, you know, working at a company like ESPN and working in development all the way through, you know, things that are in production and, and Kim and the casting pipeline. Can you each talk about your approach to your line of work, 
when it comes to authentic storytelling, how you might approach each project you take on or or day to day with your team um, in the work that you do. And I'll start if if it's all right, Lauren, I will start with you. Again? Oh man. <laughs> You're first on my screens. So. <laughs> how do I get how do I change that? No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'll, I'll popcorn around after this. Don't worry. <laughs> um yeah, I think development is uh, in many ways the tip of this the spear when it comes to um, what ends up on screen. So it's it's the blue sky phase. So a lot of it comes from what pitches am I hearing week to week? How mm-hmm. how are those people getting in the door in the first place? Um, how am I able to get those pitches right? I think that. Uh, I have seen a shift to um, to Kim's point. I have seen a shift positively over the last couple of years. Um, I think we can do a lot better. And I think it's mm-hmm. uh, incumbent on people like me and people who are above me to help make those inroads for, for stories um, that are often not told to, to, to make it all the way through the landmine that is development to a green light, right? That is that is what my job is. So finding those storytellers and um, giving them opportunities. I think uh, we have an amazing person on our team named uh, Diana Theobald, who who said, um, you know, talent is equally distributed uh, statistically across different groups and opportunity is not. So how can we create in the development sphere um, opportunities to tell those stories and support, support those storytellers. I think, um, it's, it's difficult because we're living in a world of systemic racism and sexism and ableism and, um, it, it's, it's everywhere. And so as storytellers and people who have maybe elevated power, it's our job to help dismantle that in real ways. And I think bringing those folks to the table in the first place is some small way that me and my team can do that. Um, but it's it's at every level. And I think it's putting pressure on the folks at the top to green light those stories um, and put the best the best product forward uh, in order to get them to to screen. You know, my kids, I have I have twin um, four-year-old girls, and I could not be more happy that like they're the person that they want to dress up for. This Halloween is not Elsa. No, 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 just Elsa. I think she's amazing. And like, I wish I had an Elsa when I was growing up. But now they have Luisa from Encanto, like right. giving a shout out to DreamWorks. And she's, she, she doesn't look like the princesses that I grew up with. Yeah. And I think that that took a lot of very intentional decisions in development to get to that point where my girls are like, I want to be that strong. Latina. (laughs) Um, So I think to get to more of those moments where kids can see themselves on screen, it's going to take a lot of us working hard together at every point of the process to get those voices elevated. And as, as Marcia said before, amplified. So, yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Absolutely true. And then I'm going to pivot to Kim, since we talked about on screen, Lauren, Um, Kim, sort of how do you approach your work in in this space and casting right so we like to as much as we can get involved from the development stage when projects are coming in the door because the earlier we're able to start conversations about characters and roles and how those will will um, fill out uh, a particular role world that we are building the the better opportunity we have to be more representative and reflective of again this this sort of new um, world and representation that we want to do um, and then we also work to just make ourselves aware and conscious about how we are seeing specific roles how we are setting up characters telling their stories telling and sharing their backstories because for us it's not enough for um you know 
people, pe people, particularly people of color, to continue to have marginalized roles with roles that don't have a backstory or we know nothing about them other than they're like the funny sidekick or they're the, you know, the drug dealer or the, you know, kid who's in trouble or, you know, whatever that, that story is. Um, and to Lauren's point, you know, when we have projects that come to the market like Encanto, that helps not only the kids that are seeing themselves, but it's also a way to introduce that world to somebody who may not see it, touch it, live it, or have an opportunity, you know, as they're walking through their life to experience what that is. And that's why for me, I think it's really important that we continue to be as expansive and represent representative in our storytelling, because we, we are sort of setting, you know, we're sort of like a, 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 the, the sort of basic way that society can learn about others and get to know them. Um, you know, when, and, and when we limit ourselves, we, we limit everything that we all have the potential to do, explore, and be. And do you feel like the pipeline is serving you well, Kim, in your job in terms of agencies and management companies, in terms of the talent that they're bringing on, that they're signing, that they're discovering? Do you feel like that's, the needle is moving in the right direction there? Um, um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure I know the answer to that for sure. What I do know is that I, 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 how do I want to say it? So there, there, there has been in the past a way that people have approached, you know, mining for talent. And oftentimes that is going to like the top tier agencies to sort of figure out who lead roles are. And the, the disadvantage to doing it that way or limiting yourself that way is there is, like Lauren mentioned before, a whole group of really talented people who aren't necessarily repped by those top tier agencies for all of the reasons that we've discussed. They don't have an opportunity. They don't get a chance to, you know, read for lead roles or the story is not their story. And so, um, you know, we like, again, to be as expansive as we can and bring in, you know, sort of smaller boutique agencies who may represent some of these people who are ready to step into these lead roles. They just need somebody to give them the opportunity to show what they're capable of and what they can do. Absolutely. And it, it, it sort of, you know, kind of maybe go off a little off topic, but it, it comes down to at certain points access right without Correct. necessarily having the access and a wide enough net and a wide enough pool you can't necessarily be your best authentic self or your best authentic story so i think that is really important because i find and i'll you know i'll be the one to say it you know i find a lot of times that there are there's a lot of talent out there where they have shown the work that they can do but there's not dollars attached to their name yet and so sometimes larger companies are not willing to take that risk or make that investment on them. And I do think that's an important part of, you know, the topic of authenticity in terms of who is being represented in front of the camera when it comes to story. Um, so before I stay on the scripted side of things, I'm going to go over to Marsha. Uh, Sarah, I know you play in both spaces, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to head over to Marsha. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about what um, the nonfiction side of, of your work looks like, Marcia? Um, well, it's exciting and it's challenging and it's fun, um, but you can also uh, see where there are not enough opportunities to bring in uh, first time filmmakers or even rolling it back to, again, how we go about cultivating and recruiting talent uh, who would be the producer on the piece uh, or a producer within the company. Um, so for me, if it's simply this, how do I live my day in this new wonderful role that I have? It's about opportunity. It's about listening. It's about letting go of uh, the 
the penchant that I think we've all talked about to go with, and I'm not saying that we do this, but, oh, this person has 10 films or they have X amount of awards. How about this writer who has never directed before, but understands the subject matter because he is a X, that he understands the subject matter and saying, you know what, I am gonna give this first time director an opportunity to do this because he comes to, or she or they come to the table with all of that stuff that's going to make that film that much richer. And I have to say, I get high when I'm in a room with talented people who can tell me about why their perspective is an important one to help understand this story about this athlete or what have you. So for me, it's about opportunity. It's not just me being a black woman in an executive position and remembering that Shirley Chisholm quote of, if you don't have a chair, bring, if you're not at the table, bring a folding chair, get in the room is, so I'm in the room. So now how do I open up that door to provide opportunities to others? And that means in my team and listening to maybe a little bit different of an idea that's going to speak about a story that may not be in my instance, the traditional sports story, because it's, yeah, a little bit of X's and O's, but it's gonna tell you something about a community. It's gonna tell you something about a political time. It's gonna tell you something about racial politics uh, at that particular moment when that team was winning uh, a Super Bowl or uh, an NBA championship. So I think it's all about, as we've all said here, opportunity and providing um, that space to hear people who have great ideas and don't have that traditional street cred, but we open the door and that then creates like this wonderful flow of getting new ideas and fresh perspectives to tell again the theme of our conversation, those authentic stories. Sarah, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> I could listen to you forever, Marsha. Um, I loved everything that you were saying. Um, for me, I think when I was thinking about all this stuff that I do, you know, I'm a funder, I'm an advocate, I'm a writer, and I'm a producer, right? And, um, and being Native American, I feel like I, I've done so much work educating people about Native Americans. Like I've literally like made a career of like educating people about Native Americans. And within philanthropy, and I, I think at some point I got tired because I felt like it wasn't moving fast enough. People weren't learning about our tribes or our community or the history that we all share, the true history. It was just taking too long. And um, because I started out wanting to be a journalist back when I was 16, um, I sort of went full circle and came back to storytelling and thought, okay, if I can get these stories out there um, in mainstream media and actually shift culture that way, then that's what I wanna do. And so the authentic storytelling for me is really about finding those partners that are willing to um, take chances for sure, but also are willing to, um, to, be, to take the time quite honestly, because every group that I've worked with, there's, a, there's usually a big learning curve because they don't know much about Native Americans. So, um, so we have to do that, that educational piece. And so um, for example, um, I worked with Baobab Studios um, in 2018 and 20, 2019, we won a daytime Emmy for a virtual reality project called Crow the Legend. Now, had I ever done virtual reality before? No. I was taking a big chance. Did I even know what virtual reality was? No, I did not know what virtual reality is when I walked in that room. But I had a really great relationship with um, John Legend's manager and um, he was working with Baobop and Baobop was an Asian uh, run led team that wanted to tell a Native American story and they wanted to do it right. And so they were willing to go above and beyond to get the credible talent in and to work with them. And then it led to an Emmy, which, you know, sort of like landed me like squarely into the space, right? Um, and so I'm also working on a, a documentary right now, um, Lakota Nation versus the United States, which is about the fight over the Black Hills. I'm executive producing it with Mark Ruffalo, another dear, 
amazing friend that it like puts his, you know, money where his mouth is and his activism and his storytelling and will go above and beyond and making sure that these stories are told in the way that they need to be told to make sure that we get to true authentic um, representation in, in the media and, and to equity. So I, I feel very hopeful in the space that we are right now, because I think that there are some of us that have, you know, sort of dipped our toe into everything and have done all of the educational pieces and have the large network in order to be able to bring these stories along. And, and so that makes me really excited about where we're at right now. Awesome. Not that you need the validation since you already won the Emmy, but you're definitely getting some love on your project in the chat. Um, and I also wanted to share, going back to sort of a little bit about what Marsha was talking about in terms of bringing the right people into the room, giving people opportunities. Um, Amari left a really great uh, message in the chat, just uh, stating, you know, it's crucial that when you do bring in people and you are giving people these opportunities, um, that you're making sure they have the right support, that they have the right team surrounding them to get the work done uh, in the way that it needs to be done. And I just thought that was really good. And um, Amari, I saw you got a lot of seconds on that in the chat. Um, so Sarah, you touched on a project that was done right, where it was done thoughtful. It was it, it brought in elements to make sure that authenticity was key. Um, and I know some of you are in jobs where you might not be able to share specific specifics, but I would like to um, eventually get to next. What are some projects or, or scenarios where you've encountered challenges in getting to an authentic place in a story. So let that sort of percolate. But before we go there, let's talk. Let's talk about let's talk about projects that were done right. Okay. So we'll we'll get to the challenge projects. But um, you guys have men mentioned Encanto. There's obviously I think been a lot of other projects out in the world. I just want to give everybody an opportunity to shout out something that they feel was done really well was was authentic storytelling um, and, and maybe why? What, what got you excited about that specific project? And I will start with Marsha. Um, okay, so remember I'm really new. <laughs> uh, so I wanna stick with my current role, not past. Um, I'll just say that right now on the precipice of Title IX and a 50th anniversary, we've made the remarkable and uh, long overdue uh, commitment in the space to tell stories about women athletes and tell those stories from female filmmakers. So one of them that's going to be fabulous, I don't even know if I'm supposed to talk about this now, but okay. You heard it first at Brick. Okay. Oh, I hope Palms <laughs> doesn't get mad at me. But, you know, we've, we have Dawn Porter and, you know, many, many of you know of her. Uh, through that great doc that she did recently with uh, on the, the great life of John Lewis. Uh, and she's looking at the history of Title IX. And I am so convinced that it could not have been told by anyone other than she. Uh, when I think about what I've seen thus far and what her perspective brings to the story of what Title IX has met, meant to young women in this country, female athletes, and to women who may not have followed their collegiate athletic or high school college career and have gone into something else. And now I hear these stories out there of like, oh, I was a Title IX baby. Like I was able to do X, Y, and Z because of Title IX. You see the impact that this uh, piece of legislation has meant and how much work is yet to be done, that we are like nowhere close to fulfilling the promise of Title IX. And especially when you think about where we are today in this country, but to have a female documentarian like her behind the, the, the camera in the edit room with her team, um, wow. And it's not even done yet. And I'm just, um, salivating with each moment that we get to see a little bit more of her brilliance. And I take an enormous amount of pride as a woman of color, as a black woman in this industry, uh, to see her shine and that I can run around in these spaces and go, guess what we've got? Uh, <laughs> yes, I just want more of them. So 
more opportunities for women. I want to bring, I want to put out a calling card, not just because I'm in the seat or I have the chair, that we are a place for female filmmakers and editors and producers. So uh, it's the first project that I've been able to touch uh, in my new role, but I'm awfully excited. So when you said you were in your dream role, you really were not kidding. Oh yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm it. like, I'm giddy. I mean, I'm ridiculous. I can't sleep. I'm like, oh my God, what can I do tomorrow? It's um, an amazing yeah. position to be in. Yeah. That's awesome. Really, That's really, really, really cool. Yeah. Um, Sarah, how about you? So the was it the project that went good or the project you, you, that you went touched bad? on? You touched on the VR project <laughs> that went well. So I think we'll go to a project where you faced a challenge in authentic storytelling and how you overcame that. Well, I mean, I try not to get myself into that situation, right? But um, <laughs> I, I would say there two two things. I, I would say. Um, working with people that come are come into the space as absolutes and you know and a lot of times it's uh, I think the storytelling world is really most of our, it has revolved around the white male telling the story and so we, I, I hear people saying like you know not taking the community's advice right the community says that guy should not be in that documentary because he is not a good representative and you know for various reasons and somebody's like no they have to be you know they need to be in there um so i would say that is definitely not a good scenario um especially when you're telling a story from another culture or you're involved in that community and you're trying to tell the community who should be there very very bad um and then i i would say on the other side um you know i get asked a lot you know i was recently contributing to um a good energy project i don't know if you know them but they do a lot of climate stories and are working on a playbook right now <laughs> and um and they had asked me they were they said um they asked me a question of like basically like how can we help white guys tell native american stories and i was like um uh. <laughs> That's kind of a weird question, <laughs> I, and I don't mean to call them out because I love them, and they they were being so sweet to me, <laughs> and I and I was like, well, how about just find a native writer? Right. <laughs> you know, how about that? Um, and so I think you know that really tells me that we're still making that hard turn, right? That we to be inclusive and to do the extra work to find those native writers that can tell those projects and those producers. Um, and I, I think we can get there. I, it just takes a little tiny bit more work and finding the right people to help network with you. We won't, we won't get into it, but um, you brought up documentary subjects or documentary subject matter. Um, I would just in, in regards to our panel and our discussion that we're having today, recommend everyone look a little bit into what happened this year with a particular documentary. Um, at Sundance, there's an IndieWire article uh, from a couple days ago, but it definitely had repercussions with um, the Muslim community. Um, so I do want to just kind of point that out as a case study for this particular uh, panel um, and just put that in there. We've got about seven minutes left. So we're going to go to Kim and then Lauren, and then I'm going to give you guys my last question for everyone. It's a, it's a lightning round, the last one. <gasps> So, you know, for me, from a casting perspective, there, there are a lot of sh um, shows that I think reflect um, the conversation that we're talking about, authentic storytelling, and that would be Reservation Dogs, Pose, The Harder They Fall, um, Insecure, um, I don't know, you know, Wonder Years, like there's so many, and it's, it's nice to see this wonderful sort of embracing and and change happening and my hope is that we continue to see these wonderful stories being told by these wonderfully talented casts um with you know again authenticity both in front of and behind the camera um on on the other side of things one of the challenge that challenges that we are facing and trying to figure out how to overcome as quickly as we can is performers with disabilities. Because what, what happens is there are 
met, there are so many opportunities to hire performers with disabilities in many different kinds of roles. And what I always like to do is say, we don't have to look at this as let's write a character that has these disabilities. Why don't we take one of the roles that is existing and hire somebody that has a disability and not, that does not have to be a part of the conversation. This is just who they are. And they bring that to this character and this role. One of the challenges that, that we then have is like, people are uncomfortable about, oh, well, if they, if they, you know, are challenged in their hearing or challenged in their, you know, be, ability to walk or speak, or what does that mean? And how do we do? And, and my thing is, right, that's on us to now figure out how to accommodate for that. It, cause that's what we have to do because they're, Absolutely. they exist, you know, in the world that we live in. And so for me, that is, is, is something that I'm really passionate about, you know, as well as, again, more representation across the board. Absolutely, that's amazing. Um, and Lauren? Um, yeah, I think I've been at Cartoon Network almost 10 months now, and I was always jealous of Cartoon Network when I wasn't here of the, the kind of programming that they had because of um, the, the diversity of stories and storytellers. It's very artist-driven, which I love, and they're original stories. So. I look at Steven Universe, I look at Craig of the Creek, I look at um, Victor and Valentino, and I see these shows that are that broke a lot of barriers for, for other people coming up behind them. And I, I get excited about our slate and coming up because, you know, Steven Universe broke so many barriers that no one else in animation had done at that time, um, especially for LGBTQIA plus representation. And that was really exciting to me. I think Craig of the Creek is the one that I would really point to though, um, as something where we're taking beyond just a show and now it's become a franchise and it's now there's a spinoff preschool show. Our first preschool show from Cartoon Network is Jessica's Big Little World. And, um, you know, Tiffany Ford is getting to show like what it's like to be a little black girl in animation from her perspective. And I think that is really exciting to me because I think, you know, to Sarah's point, there have been traditionally um, mostly white males telling young girls story and other people of color and they're brought in to help supplement. And I think if anything, it should be the other way around <laughs> um, just as a starting point, but eventually people are just able to tell, tell the stories from their perspectives. Um, and I think it's, we've got a long way to go, but I, I'm, I'm very optimistic that um, because of shows like Craig of the Creek, that there's going to be more of that to come. Awesome. So we've got two minutes before we head into our breakout rooms to get some work done. Um, so I want to wrap up. And by the way, this has been amazing. Round of applause, you guys, incredible so far. Uh, I wanna wrap up with a lightning round. What, what is the cost of inauthentic storytelling? Both monetary cost to, to someone who is putting out that content and what is the cost to our audiences? What do our audiences lose from inauthentic storytelling? If, if anyone wants to lightning that to start, feel free to jump right in. Amari likes my question, by the way. So does Nicole and Allison. Marsha, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with you. I feel like we talked about this. Um, uh, oh, can you hear me? OK, because I think I was muted. All right. Well, wait, we have two minutes for everybody or two yep. minutes per person? So, so, so cost, cost okay. monetary, cost for the audience. Uh, um, and I don't know if I can answer the monetary one, but I can certainly talk about the cost to the audience. When we are not putting out uh, stories that are reflective of the community and told in, in a voice or in a way that is representative of that community, we lose trust. And if we don't have, if we don't maintain that trust, we're host. Um, you know, for me, it's just thinking about how I want to represent our films, ESPN films, to represent um, 
the best narrative storytelling in sports documentaries. If we get it wrong and we lose that opportunity because we can be stealth-like in a sports doc. You can think like you're watching a film about a team or an athlete or a period of time, but actually we can be sneaky and kind of put all of this great stuff and educate you folks. Um, and if we don't get that right, then the opportunities that we have as filmmakers to continue to do these stories that are multi-layered so that you, you, you come in thinking it's a story about the New York Mets, but it's actually a story about bad behavior in the 1990s and what havoc was wreaked uh, during that period. And if we don't get that right, then I don't get chances to green light more projects that are a little bit different that are not what you think they are coming through the door. You lose that uh, ability to be um, truly creative. Um, next. I'm not sure if we have time to do more. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna defer to the chat uh, for someone to let me know if we need to go into the breakout rooms or not. Um, Let's see, dun, 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 keep going. Okay, I have, so Lauren, <laughs> I wanna go to you because you're dealing with a lot of kids content. This is a young audience. What's, what's the cost? Um, the cost is <laughs> the <laughs> systems that are in place will continue and, um, and change won't happen and oppression will continue. <laughs> I don't know that's the real cost. And I, I don't think any of us want that for the future for our kids. I think kids need to see themselves reflected on screen authentically so they can say, yeah, that is me. That is my experience. And look what I can do. Look what I can become. I think the cost is very high on just a very global and spiritual level. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. And I think, I mean, just monetarily, which is what most people, it's show business as they say um people will find it elsewhere i think i that is one thing that i am hopeful for with if if people are voting with their their feet and their eyes and they're they're going to go find that content and make it themselves um mm -hmm. if we're not going to do it so i think there's a a very there's a monetary incentive as well but more for the souls of everyone involved in telling these stories i think mm -hmm. the, the cost is very high that um the change that we hope can happen won't happen if those stories aren't told um, and told from these next generation's perspective. Thank you guys so much, Kim, Sarah, I'm sorry we didn't get to you. We gotta go to the breakout rooms. This panel has been amazing so far. Let's get some work done. See you guys in the breakout rooms. Thank you guys. <laughs>